The story of Abraham is the first story, so to speak, in the history of salvation. A God came wandering down the road one day to the home of Abram and uh, stopped and began to form a relationship with him. He began to ask for a meal, some hospitality, which was a very, very important thing in the ancient world because where did you have to go if you were traveling? Uh, there weren't like all sorts of hotels and uh, fast food places. So it was considered to be a great honor, actually a slight, if someone would be coming by, they would refuse your hospitality, it would be an insult. And so God came with two, probably angels, and even God is not really identified, he's just one of the three, and begins to talk to Abraham, and begin to talk to Abraham about having a definitive relationship with him, making all sorts of promises that in a sense were in one sense uh, really preposterous. He said, I will give you uh, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. And I will give you all of these lands that I'm going to take you to. And I will make you famous. Now, about all these children, the problem was that Abraham and Sarah had no children and they were in their 80s. And so when Sarah was behind the tent flap, and she heard God say this to Abram, she laughed. <laughs> Later on, they had a conversation. God said, I heard you laugh. She said, I didn't laugh. God said, oh, yes, you did. I heard you. 
So she laughed then, but maybe when she became pregnant, she didn't laugh quite so much as she did. Uh, she ended up having Isaac. Isaac, of course, had Esau and Jacob, and Jacob, of course, became Israel, and he had the 12 tribes of the house of Israel. Now, God magnificently fulfilled his promises to Abraham. And now, we see in the first reading that God made the covenant with Abraham in a rather strange way. If we were to make some sort of contract with people, uh, the first thing we do is call the lawyers, and they would prepare the documents, and we would set up a time, and we would sign our signature. And that, of course, would be legally binding. In this, it was a little different because people didn't really sign their names anyway, and if they did, nobody would really know for sure if it was a forgery because they didn't have handwriting experts back then. But even then, it was says, even looser than that. But you had these animals, and you took the animals and you cut them in half, but one on this side and one on that side, and then both parties would walk through the cut up animals. And the sense was, you're saying, may I be as these animals if I don't uphold my end of the bargain? May I be cut in two? May I be killed? Such is my word, such is my promise. Of course, people break promises, we know that. But in this case, God said, I'm not going to bind you, Abraham. I'm only binding myself. And so he put Abraham seemingly into a trance, this great sense of darkness. And God came then in the darkness as a bolt of pot of, of, of hot, flaming fire. and came through and burned up the animals, subsumed the sacrifice, thus binding himself. Only as if Abraham said, Abraham would trust him. And of course, Abraham and God, of course, asked us this morning also to trust in him. Because the sacrifice he has made with us, of course, is much greater than any kind of sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of his own son. Hard for us to understand, but understand in the ancient world, sacrifice of animals and sometimes of humans was the way in which people sealed the bargain, sealed the contract. So God scratched his head and said, what can I do to make it really real to people that I really intend to have a relationship with them, that I really intend to be one with them? I really want to do this the best way I can do it, the most powerful way I can do it. So God thought and he thought and he thought. And then he came to the conclusion he had to come himself. The person, the second person of the Trinity, and he had to do this himself. You know, the old thing is, if you want to do something, do it yourself. And so God came. He didn't send another prophet, but he sent his own son. The reading today in the gospel uh, sort of empowers this because we go back a chapter or so, actually eight days to be exact. Uh, Jesus had told the apostles about his forthcoming death and resurrection. We spoke it before, the apostles had uh, great plans for Jesus. Uh, they planned to make Jesus great, to be powerful, and they themselves, of course, would be equally powerful. Uh, they would have little thrones, they would be very important, they would be dukes and duchesses and, and uh, counts, and they would be very wealthy themselves. That wasn't part of God's plan for them, but that was their plan. So now maybe Jesus realized that they didn't get the point, they didn't really understand. And so he said, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a little something, a little tonic, so you can bear this difficult message that I'm giving to you, that I'm going to die. And don't be counting on these dukedoms and these great powers of influence and a Secretary of State, Secretary of War, Secretary of the Interior, ain't going to happen. So they go up to the mountain to pray, Peter, James, and John, the sort of the inner three. And it says there Jesus was transfigured. He was transformed and changed in the sense that he glowed from within. In the sense the divinity sort of began to press out. He became illumined. Of course, we always see in the pictures that he's raised up into the air. But together with him is Moses and Elijah. Moses, the great lawgiver, uh, one of the great figures of Jewish history. Elijah, the prophet, who was carried body and soul into heaven in a fiery chariot. Two major, major figures, big time stars in Jewish history. And so the three of them are there transformed and transfused and, trained and illuminated. And uh, St. Luke tells us what Matthew and Mark did not tell us. What did they talk about? What was it all about? Is that they came to talk to him about his forthcoming exodus. Now, exodus, we know, means initially, when later on, 
when the Jews are led out of Egypt by Moses to the promised land. Now Jesus is leading the new dispensation, his new people, out of sin and darkness into the marvelous light of the kingdom of God and ultimately heaven. So Peter wants to set up three tents. This, can you imagine how wonderful this was to see this? How it just totally taken away you were. So Peter said, let's forget that Jerusalem thing. Let's stay here. Let's set up three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. But obviously, probably, in Peter's mind, the big deal was Moses and Elijah and little Jesus whom they knew. We had to clarify. It says they were surrounded by a cloud. Out of the cloud came a voice from the Father. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Of course, it's not just a word for back then, for Peter, James, and John. The word, of course, goes out to us this morning. How much do we listen to him? We live in a very noisy world. Our ears are constantly being bombarded by all sorts of messages, all sorts of commercials, all sorts of things in various ways try to change our mentality, to try to change who we are and what we are. And without realizing it, sometimes we're slowly but surely moved a little bit to the wrong side. We don't have time to pray because we're too busy, 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 busy. And sometimes even when we pray, we just bombard God with all sorts of words. And God is saying, shut up! I love you, but I wish you'd be quiet and listen to me. Because i got stuff to say too. i got things I want to say to you. I want to say things to you about my love for you and my care. And I want, like with Peter, James, and John, to give you affirmations and support and strength so you can live out the gospel message that I'm calling you to live. You're not called to do it by yourself. It's not all about you. It's all about Jesus as me. It's all about the Father. St. Paul just said in the second reading that our citizenship is in heaven. We only have a visa for this life. We're only here temporarily. Every once in a while, God renews our visa for a couple of years. Finally, our visa will run out. And then we're being called into a new and bigger and better life. A new existence called heaven. What's it going to be like? I have no idea. Except God tells us it will be perfect. It will make uh, the transfiguration look like nothing. We will be sort of like Peter, James, and John. We'll want to stay with that vision. We'll want to stay there. We'll want to be with God always. And unlike Peter, James, and John, we won't have to leave. The most important thing right now is that we've got to stay. We've got to begin to live the life of holiness and goodness that God calls us to so we can be what God wants us to be. And because the world around us does not support us, and they wouldn't even support one another a lot of times in doing that, it's important that we make a decision in this Lenten season. That's what it's all about. A retreat, a time to be transfigured, to be changed, to be renovated. For our sake. So that we can be all that God calls us to be. So we make sure when the time comes, our visa runs out, that we surely have citizenship in heaven. And God calls us there. It's such a marvelous gift that God gives to us, the covenant he makes with us. He doesn't ask us to die for the covenant, but he dies. And think about it. This person dying on the cross is God himself in human form. He's saying, if you get the message, do you understand? God must be awfully frustrated because he thought he had the perfect plan that everybody would get it. But we see so many people, even ourselves who are here, Sometimes we don't get it. So let's take a little bit of time to listen to him this week. It's difficult sometimes because we're not comfortable with silence. Turn off the radio, turn off the music, turn off everything, and pray a little bit, but then just sit quietly and listen. Maybe not a whole lot will happen that first time, or the second time, or the third time, but eventually God begins to begin to tune us in. So God is sort of like a radio in some way. You gotta keep gotta be trying different channels. We begin to find him and find what he's there. So let's ask the Lord then to bless us in this Lenten season to realize the great gift that he's giving to us so we can open ourselves up to receive it and continue to be changed and transformed by it.